And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 2.30. Up next, Education Today. Those of KPFA in Berkeley... This is Education Today. Good afternoon and welcome to Education Today. One of the most important current developments in schooling is the disturbing takeover of educational functions by for-profit companies. This began largely in the U.S. and England and now is spreading around the globe by something which Finland educator Pasi Salberg calls germ, the global economic reform movement which is spreading for-profit enterprises across the globe. Pearson, a British-based company operating widely within the U.S., is the largest of these generating a billion dollars in 2012 and scoring 124 million exams. Among the tests they create and administer are tests for K-12 students on the Common Core, tests for prospective teachers, the graduate record exam, and many, many others. Tests are, by and large, in my opinion, a commodity which has no social usefulness. That is, unlike a car, a telephone, or a bag of potatoes, which have a function for the individual purchaser, individuals are required to purchase Pearson tests only as a mediator to education or employment, and one required by schools and governments because those schools and governments have legislated with little public input that these mediating instruments are actually necessary. Since their origin a hundred years ago, these exams have privileged more white and more affluent test takers consistently. I have argued that their primary function is creating profits for the companies that make them and justifying the continued privileges of more affluent people in U.S. society. Pearson creates tests that everyone must take, and it sells the books that have the content that everyone has to read if they are going to do well on the tests. What a scam. Education professor Michael Apple said about Pearson, Pearson has been the most creative and the most aggressive at taking over all those things we used to take as part of the public sector's responsibility. They receive no-bid contracts. They have huge teams of lobbyists urging both expansion of testing and expanded use of their product. Today, we're going to speak with Professor Alan Singer from Hofstra University about the impact of the Common Core Standards on Children's Literacy, the tests Pearson has administered related to the Common Core, and the expansion of Pearson to developing countries. Dr. Singer writes frequently for the Huffington Post, he and he is a highly regarded press professor by his students. Later in the show, we'll be talking with someone else about participatory economics, a subject which is actually quite related. Dr. Singer, welcome to Education Today. Kitty, thank you for having me. I, I have to tell you, I love the germ global economic reform movement. That was brilliant. Isn't it brilliant? It's, yes. it's so captures. It's, it's something you can really remember and you feel it in your gut that that actually is what it is. A germ. Yes, it's a germ. <laughs> Definitely a germ infecting really a big part of the country. I mean, of the world, actually. Mm. So before we get into talking about Pearson and their tests directly, I wanted to ask you about some comments that you've made on the Common Core Standards, which we have discussed a few times uh, on this show. That is the new st set of standards which a number of uh, billionaire uh, philanthropists and, uh, and elected officials have come to spread around the country as the standards that all students are supposed to meet. Um, and there is controversy about them as well. And you have particularly raised the issue of the approach which the standards take to children learning to read. And as a professor of teachers, I wonder if you could tell us about your concerns, which are, I believe, beyond the testing, but to the approach itself. All right. Again, I'm speaking not only as a professor of education, but also as a parent and a grandparent. You know, children learn to read the way they learn to talk. Reading, like speaking, is a social activity best taught by community and through relationship. Children learn by watching older adults, especially older children, read. 
They learn to read by discovering that important things they want to know about are in the symbols. They learn to read because of the pleasure of discovery, because of praise from parents, teachers, and siblings, and friends for their achievement. But they do not learn to read because of tests. <laughs> but in Common Core-based instruction, what they've done is they've turned reading into a mechanical activity that ignores student interest and the primary motivation to learn is your test score. Now, to raise student test scores, Common Core breaks reading down into a plethora of component skill parts. Let me give you an example. In the fourth grade Common Core, there are nine reading literature standards, 10 reading informational text standards, two foundational reading skill standards, six language active position standards, six speaking and listening standards, as well as a range of quality and complexity standards. Uh, it's mind-boggling. And lost, if not missing at all, is the barrage of standards. It's qualities like imagination, sharing, creating, thinking, right. enjoying. Right. You know, asking questions, having conversations, they're there as activities, but they're not emphasized as a core of understanding. And if the teacher is worried about checking off little chunks of the reading, they're not doing what really needs to happen to make reading an enjoyable activity in a classroom, which is sit the kids around in the circle, have them read silently or a little bit together, or you read to them, and you, then you have a discussion. But if you're worried about checking off something that's going to actually be contained within that conversation you have, but you're worrying about teaching it in isolation, the kids probably aren't going to learn it. Thank you for raising those uh, issues, because I know there's been a little bit more confusion about the Common Core Standards right. themselves. Now I'm wondering also if you could comment some on the um, on the issue of the Pearson tests, which I know you have also opposed. Well, Pearson business practices leave a bad taste in many people's mouths. Uh, the companies for promoting programs, and I think you mentioned this earlier, that in effect promote their products and they give money to political, foundational groups. Jed Bush's Foundation for Excellence in Education gets money from Pearson. You know, in Los Angeles, the iPad program is now being investigated by the federal government for collusion. In New York State, the Attorney General forced Pearson to pay millions of dollars in penalties for questionable practices. So this is a company that plays fast and loose with the law. Now, Pearson just lost a approximately $50 million contract to provide third to eighth grade Common Core line high stakes tests in New York State. It's also lost contracts in Texas and Florida. Uh, local newspapers here have said, you know, we're looking at part of the ongoing debate over the testing and maybe that's what's affecting Pearson. But I think a big part of this is Pearson's approach to testing, which is different from other companies. I'm not saying other companies do it well, but I say Pearson does it particularly poorly. Pearson sells packaged exams. Pearson maintains trademark control over the exams. Teachers are told they are not allowed to discuss questions on the exams, either to improve their practice or to help kids understand what they need to know. In New Jersey, Students left the Pearson exam, and on Facebook and other social media, they were discussing the test, and Pearson was monitoring students on social media and reported it to the state, wanted the students reprimanded because they were violating Pearson trademark. <laughs> Oh, wow, that's right. amazing. It is amazing. So what we have are packaged exams that are not aligned with any kind of curriculum that states may develop. The classic case is the Pearson Pineapple. Pearson has a question on the uh, middle school reading test on a race between a pineapple and a hair. Now, First problem is urban kids that I know don't know what a hare is. If they said a rabbit, at least kids would know that pineapple's racing a rabbit. Kids who do know what a hare is know that the, the passage is absurd. And they look at the choices and they say, this is all ridiculous. And they, they get them wrong. Pearson's response was that this was a reading test and the answer was in the passage. And that the fact that the passage was ridiculous doesn't uh, invalidate the uh, questions. 
That's a Pearson test. One of the reasons New York State dumped them is it's looking for a company that will align the tests with New York State curriculum and involve teachers and other stakeholders in discussion. I don't know if this is going to happen, but this is a big problem with Pearson's testing approach. So thank you. Um, it, I, it seems to me, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly happy that happened. Uh, I think that uh, Pearson does seem to be particularly pernicious uh, in, in a lot of their practices and, and certainly their focus on profit. But I wonder if uh, it may not be problematic anyway because the tests in general and the idea of testing com on Common Core is problematic even if you have some participation. So uh, will it be that much better? I don't know. Look, I'm not against tests. As a high school teacher, uh, New York State had a standardized test in, uh, in, for students in 10th and 11th grade social studies. Uh, 10th grade was global, 11th grade was U.S. I found the test useful to me as a teacher because it helped me to put together where the end goal was in terms of content, skills, and understanding for my students. But, of course, those tests were available online for teachers mm -hmm. and students and parents mm -hmm. to examine. So people said, this is what we need to know. This is the literacy level we need to have. Pearson tests, mostly standardized tests, are secret. It's very difficult. You can't use them to design better instruction. They're not designed to promote instruction. One of the problems in New York State with the last round of Pearson tests, kids took the test in April. Schools were returned to schools and families. They're scheduled to come back in October. Mm, right. Not only are the kids with different teachers, but many of the kids are now in different schools. Right. How are those tests? going to help anybody improve instruction for those kids. Now, the other question I wanted to ask you about, and something I've only been learning about recently, is that there is a gigantic movement to take uh, Pearson and, I guess, other for-profit companies to take their some sort of education quote that they create and use it in a privatized way in the underdeveloped world where people are trying to create their own educational systems. I wonder if you could say a little bit about that because that is quite disturbing. Right. Now remember Pearson is a British company though North America, meaning the United States, is its largest market. It's probably about 60% of its market. Now, there's been a, a growing international pushback against Pearson. Um, you said before, just earlier that everything seems to be about profit. I think that's the key thing. Pearson is a private company, and it's all about profit. Yesterday, it sold the Financial Times of London to a Japanese company as part of its transition from print to digital education. Wow. Pearson sees digital education as the wave of the future, and this is something that scares me and a lot of other people. In April, protesters from teachers' unions and global justice groups actually stormed the gates at Pearson's annual general meeting that was held in London. And the protesters accused Pearson of turning education into a commodity and profiting from low-fee, private-for-profit schools in poverty-stricken regions, Africa and the Indian subcontinent. Now, this is funny. Pearson's chief executive officer, John Fallon, was forced to respond to dissidents, and he declared his enthusiastic support for free public education every child around the world. However, he did not offer to provide Pearson's educational services for free. <laughs> right. If you, go, now, if, you, if you got some money, you're welcome to provide education. Otherwise, you're stuck with us, right? Right. Now, Fallon also must have forgotten that in 2012, when Pearson launched its... Uh, fund to invest in private schools in Africa and Asia. That, and, and now, it's it aimed at providing affordable education for poor children. Fallon promised Pearson investors that the venture was going to be profitable. This is about profit. Now, Pearson and affiliated companies, such as one called Bridge International Academy, is now operating in Kenya and Uganda. And they're moving into Nigeria, India, and other countries. They have about... Um, over 100,000 pupils in more than 400 schools. 
Now, one of the things that concerns me very much is that once the platforms are in place for providing digital education, well, those platforms can be used anywhere. They could be used to compete with schools in uh, the United States and Great Britain and Canada as well. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing that's interesting, and it, I, I, I was at a conference in uh, Madrid two weeks ago, an international educational conference. I met people from South Africa and people from New Zealand and Australia where they're very involved in pushback against Pearson. And one of the women from uh, South Africa teaches at a university that is going digital. And uh, they're doing a lot of online work. And the claim is that this will allow us to bring educational services to people in the, um, you know, in the distant countryside. But the point she made in, in discussion was that while these people don't have access to university or school seats, classrooms, they also don't have access to computers and the Internet. <laughs> right. You know, so what we're doing is we're pressing governments to provide uh, Internet access and computers and purchase programs that companies like Pearson are selling. Mm -hmm. Now, again, we talked about Pearson's business practices. One of the things that Pearson did is it brought online uh, Sir Michael Barber. Sir Michael Barber. Mm -hmm. He's now the head of Pearson's third world effort. And uh, Barber was previously with the British government. He was also with McKinsey. He has been very involved in the interaction of the private sector with the British government, with investment companies, these are not philanthropists. These are businessmen, and their goal is profit. Wow. So that is a really uh, important uh, development, the interlinks between the yes. British government, McKinsey, which is huge, and uh, Pearson. And, of course, this makes it more difficult for these these poorer countries to be able to develop their own systems. I really appreciate your talking with us about this. Uh, I want to tell our listeners we are speaking with Alan Singer, S-I-N-G-E-R. He writes widely in the Huffington Post, and a lot of the information that he's been talking about today you can find in his uh, articles. If you Google him, uh, Alan Singer, there are a number of articles which are very interesting and cover some of the same topics that we've been talking about. Thank you so much much for speaking with us and i hope we'll be able to do it again thank you for having me it yes. was a great pleasure thank you bye-bye bye-bye now um <clears throat> in our last minutes we're going to be talking with deborah rogers and you're listening to education today on kpfa fm we're broadcasting live from berkeley and uh, Deborah is the president of Initiative for Equality, which is a global network of activists who are fighting to overturn social, economic, and political inequalities and exclusion and working to build mechanisms for full participation by everyone. Deb is based here in Oakland, and um, she has been working on issues particularly recently about solidarity economics and participatory approaches to economics and I've as I've said previously on this show we focus on education but we understand that it's interlinked with everything else that's happening in the world including whether there is an economic basis for the families that of the children that are trying to be educated Deborah Rogers welcome to education today yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yes. So um, I wanted to ask you about, I know you were at the U.S. So Social Forum and presented recently, and I wonder if you could tell us your impressions about the U.S. Social Forum and, and what it's up to. Sure. Just very quickly, you know, my organization is global. We're in over 115 countries. And my impression at the U.S. Social Forum was that lots of people in the United States are starting to realize that we have a lot in common with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, in the past, the U.S. has somehow viewed itself as exceptional and maybe different from the rest of humanity. But now with our economy eroding and poverty and inequality rising, it's becoming really clear that we can no longer buy our way out of the problems that are faced by the rest of the world. So for me, this is really good news. We have to join the rest of the world and work, work towards system change together rather than somehow being separate. Yeah. 
Yeah. And this this was a theme at the U.S. Social Forum. And, and where was it in, was it in Philadelphia? You're right. So the U.S. Social Forum um, this year was split into two places. The main one was in Philadelphia. There was also one here in San Jose. But I was asked by the organizers of the one in Philadelphia to go out there because they were very focused on some of these um, new economy approaches. And um, I have a working relationship with them out there. So I went to Philly. So can you tell us about this workshop on, um, I guess, economic solidarity uh, and economic development? What's significant about it? Sure. So my organization, Initiative for Equality, collaborated with um, one of the coordinators of the U.S. Social Forum named uh, Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. Uh, They're a U.S.-based network, and we put on a workshop together called Building a Sustainable people-centered economy through participatory economic development. And if if I can just take a minute, I'd like to um, tell you we covered three main areas in our workshop. Um, first of all, we talked about how to distinguish between new economy or solidarity economy approaches and the dominant economic paradigm that we all live under right now. And the main criteria that we came up with were uh, six things. One, public or participatory ownership democratic decision-making, accountability to the community rather than to shareholders or something, generating increasing levels of equality over time rather than decreasing as we've been seeing, being environmentally sustainable, and finally being socially sustainable. In other words, you know, promoting equitable and stable social relationships in the community rather than tearing the community up apart because of inequalities and so forth. You know, not all of the things that we think of as new economy necessarily meet these criteria. You know, for example, you could start up a worker-owned cooperative that was really very exclusive or elitist and had no accountability to the broader community. Mm -hmm. And this isn't really the model of development we want. So we have to be very aware of all these criteria. Um, the second thing we talked about were some strategies for launching participatory economic development that could be used at the community level. And here, here's the thing. If we want an economy that works for everyone, we need to involve everyone in establishing and maintaining and governing these enterprises. You know, you can't expect to have a very kind of top-down approach to that, but somehow serve the entire community. So here are some steps that we came up with for doing that. First of all, identify a group of people to spearhead the effort, you know, the people who are really excited about this and want to throw some energy into it. Second, you need to link to local and national networks so that you can get ideas and support and resources. Third, you have got to conduct discussions in the local communities or even neighborhoods to identify what are the needs, what are the opportunities there, and what are some resources that are available right there in the community, which might include people or infrastructure or possibly financial, you know, access to finances. Um, fourth, you need to review all the options of different kinds of enterprises that might work well. Um, don't just go for a worker cooperative bakery, you know, we may have a lot of those already. So look at all the different options. And then finally, develop your plan with lots of community input. So don't just go off in a room with a few of you and, and decide what you're going to do. So, and, uh -huh, so sure. before you go on, um, are there examples of this? Because I guess the thing that strikes me is the, the, the criteria you've laid out sound wonderful. I'm wondering who and where people find the actual financial resources to do it. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a huge question. But let me tell you, there are examples of these things all over the country and, of course, the world. But let's just talk about the U.S. here. Um, so the kinds of different enterprises that could fit these criteria and that in in um, you know kind of on a case by case basis do fit these criteria um, could either be private or they could be public so the private ones could be worker owner cooperatives uh, they could be consumer cooperatives like food co-ops or electric co-ops 
Um, they could be consumer producer cooperatives. These are actually fairly common in Germany around uh, alternative energy. They could be user-owned water districts. These are common in certain parts of the United States, or maybe not common, but they're certainly good examples. Agricultural cooperatives, well, possibly with joint land ownership or joint ownership of facilities to um, uh, take the raw product and turn it into something that they can market. Healthcare and health insurance cooperatives, um, These some of these are already exist, housing cooperatives, um, barter systems. You know, there's a fantastic network of people on a barter system uh, here in California in a rural area. Uh, credit unions are an example on um, community currencies. So those are all really good examples that are in existence um, all over the country, and they're in the private sector. And then other examples are public. So we've got um, community development corporations, but you have to be very careful with these that they aren't just captured by uh, an elite group. You've got to make sure that they're broad-based and truly democratic um, governance. Um, community or state-owned banks and industries. You know, I grew up in South Dakota when we had a state-owned cement plant. You know, it sounded like something you'd have in Bulgaria, but it worked really well for the state and generated revenue. So let um, me, let me yeah. ask you uh, about a couple sure. of the ones that you've mentioned. So, um sure. Uh, among the ones that probably some of the regular people among us participate in are credit unions. So you yeah. would think credit unions in general do qualify for the kind of participatory economic development you're talking about. It depends on how they're run. If you do it properly, it's possibly the best, most foundational enterprise that could be started up to start a solidarity economy in a community because you know, everything is dependent on financing. Right. Uh, if a credit union is based on um, the money coming in from the people who use that bank, they're in the community, they ins- they have good bylaws and so forth to ensure democratic governance by the people who have their money in there, and they also have good bylaws to ensure um, the criteria for what kinds of enterprises they support. You bet it could be the very best thing, not only in terms of being solidarity economy in and of itself, but in terms of supporting additional, um, you know, new economic approaches. So I, I just think credit unions is one of the very best things if it's done well if it's done badly then you know nobody's being helped so we only have another minute left and i wanted in that time to ask you where people can look to find more information you've mentioned many things that i know people would be interested in both public things that we might be able to push our elected officials to do and privately done things uh, which seem to have a lot of potential so is there a way for people to get more information about the solidarity economics potential projects and approaches and where people are doing things Absolutely. As a matter of fact, there's a list of resources on my website. You can go to our website at initiativeforequality.org. And um, if you search around, we have a section called Participatory Enterprises. And if you go there, you'll find links to the workshop that we just put on in Philadelphia. And we have a huge number of resources there. They're all clickable links to different organizations and resources and a, a huge discussion about this on the website. So I encourage people to get involved with us, and they're very welcome to contact me personally through that website. So I want to uh, say again, you're listening to Education Today on KPFA. We've been talking with Deborah Rogers, who's from the Initiative for Equality, which is an international organization doing a lot of empowerment initiatives around the world. One of those is working on participatory economic development, and again, their website is Initiative for Equality, and you can look there for some of the resources uh, about the kinds of projects we've been talking about. Thank you so much, Deborah, for being with us today. Um, I'm your host, Kitty Kelly Epstein. You can follow us on Twitter, which is at educate, the number two, day, 941 and you can find our Facebook page Education Today KPFA. I want to thank our board operator Erica Bridgman, our producer Jaron Epstein and our guests. Looking forward to talking with you again in a couple weeks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Are you interested in running as a candidate in the local station board election? 
there is still time. The candidate nomination period has been extended and you now have until Sunday, July 26, 8 p.m. local station time to submit your candidate nomination package. For more information about the candidate requirements, please contact me, your local election supervisor, Nelsie Batista, at kpfa-les at pacifica.org or call me at 510-629-1458. You can also visit the elections website at elections.pacifica.org. We will be hosting another signing party on Friday, July 24th from 6 to 9 p.m. at KPFA in Berkeley on the first floor. See you there. Thank you.